This is Stephen Todman, and today we will be discussing genetic syndromes involving the heart as part of the Pediatric Board Review Series. This is going to be an interactive case-based lecture, and we're going to focus on high-yield images that you might see on the pediatric board exam. We can see from the content outline that genetics is 3% of the total exam weight and cardiology is 4% of the total exam weight. This is a typical karyotype. With these karyotypes, we can see different cytogenetic abnormalities. We can pick up trisomies, um, uh, monosomies like Turner syndrome, uh, Wolf-Hirschhorn, or Creedshot. This is a typical cytogenetic abnormality, uh, Wolf-Hirschhorn. We see that the facies uh, demonstrate a uh, typical appearance of a Greek warrior helmet. So let's start off with case one. We have a patient with a midline facial, facial defect. Uh, we see holoprosencephaly, polydactyly, narrow hyperconvex fingernails, and the key point here is the skin defect of the posterior scalp, which is also known as cutis aplasia. 80% of these patients will have a congenital heart defect. Uh, it could be a VSD, PDA, ASD, or you can have dextroposition. The median survival is seven days, and the overwhelming majority die in the first year of life. So what is your diagnosis? I'll give you some time to contemplate. So if you guess trisomy 13, give yourself a high five. In case two, we have a four month old dysmorphic boy. We're not told the actual uh, features of the dysmorphic appearance. And he presents for a well child checkup, the patient's uh, malnourished, tachycardic, tachypneic. There's a three out of six holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border as well as a mid-diastolic rumble, and there is hepatomegaly present. Here's this kid's EKG, and I'll give you some time to ponder. So what's your diagnosis? We have McCune Albright, Treacher Collins, Sturge Weber, trisomy 21, and neurofibromatosis. Did you guess trisomy 21? If so, congratulations. The typical phenotype is due to an extra copy of the proximal part of 21Q22, and there's Three different types of trisomies. Most of the time you have a full trisomy, but you can also have mosaicism or translocation. Features of trisomy 21 include this transverse palmar crease. You can see short stature, hypotonia, moderate to severe MR, sleep apnea, but the protruding tongue is something I definitely want you to remember. These children have absolutely beautiful eyes. Um, you can see these brush field spots. The arrow is pointing towards one. And they have multiple other uh, ophthalmologic problems, including refractive errors, strabismus, and nystagmus. You see upslanting palpebral fissures. They have flat nasal bridges. And they can have partial edontia or microdontia. Uh, edontia is uh, an absence of teeth, and microdontia is small teeth. But there's more. The uh, ears uh, can demonstrate an overfolded helix. You can have hearing loss and atlantoaxial instability. I had one patient who, um, whose dad uh, told me that they were into gymnastics, and I usually tried to... Um, you know, not step on the toes of pediatricians, but I was quite concerned about this atlantoaxial instability, and I was like, hey, uh, well, at least you don't, um, you know, do tumbling or anything like that, right? And then uh, the dad said, no, of course, we do tumbling all the time. So at that point, I was extremely worried about the atlantoaxial instability, and I uh, instructed him that that's not a great idea, and that he should talk to his uh, general pediatrician about that. 
So 40 to 50% of patients are going to have congenital heart disease, most commonly 43% with an AV canal, and next most common is a VSD. There are many types of AV canals. You can see complete, intermediate, transitional, partial, but the most common is the complete, where we see a primum ASD and an inlet VSD and one uh, uh, AV valve annulus, and that's uh, commonly seen in trisomy 21. Here's an echocardiogram. Uh, for pediatrics, we would call this upside down, but clearly you can see the, um, in, the, in this four-chamber view, we see one AV valve in the center, and we can see uh, a primum ASD and VSD as well. Common GI uh, and abdominal findings include diastasis recti, umbilical hernia, uh, duodenal atresia, Hirschsprungs, and TE fistula. Make sure you remember the TE fistula. They also have a fifth finger clinodactyly, which is this short fifth finger that curves inward, as well as the sandal gap deformity of the great toe. And we see the first and second toes are uh, spaced uh, with increased skin creases. Additional features of trisomy 21 include endocrine features like hypothyroidism and diabetes. And as, for, as far as hematologic uh, manifestations, they can have this neonatal leukemoid reaction as well as an increased risk of leukemia. All right, who's ready for case two? So we have a female infant with a single umbilical artery. They have profound psychomotor delay, mental retardation, hypotonia, and seizures. They were born at a low birth weight. They have microcephaly, micronathia, closed fists with overlapping fingers. Other clues are cerebellar hypoplasia, microophthalmia. They have low set malformed ears, a short sternum, and a clenched hand. There's a three out of six holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border. Unfortunately, like sometimes on exams, the question is a third order question. So what's the likelihood of congenital heart disease in this child? If you guessed answer E, feel free to celebrate. So what is the most likely genetic condition? Is it trisomy 18, trisomy 13, Wolf-Hirshhorn, Rett syndrome, or prader willi The correct answer is trisomy 18. So this is trisomy 18. Additional manifestations of trisomy 18 include pulmonary hypoplasia, GI abnormalities, GU abnormalities, and the specific uh, endocrine issues that they may have is uh, thymic thyroid and adrenal hypoplasia. As far as cardiac findings, the most common is a VSD, but they can have uh, many additional findings. 50% uh, of them are going to die within the first week, and most of the remaining die within the first year of life. All right, hurling forward to case number three. We have a 12-year-old short female in for a well-child checkup. The physical exam demonstrates an apical ejection click, a 2 out of 6 systolic ejection murmur that best radiates to the carotids. And she has a broad chest with widely spaced nipples and congenital lymphedema. Here is your typical EKG. All right, save my baby. What is this? Is this a bicuspidic valve, a VSD, an ASD? pulmonary stenosis, or a PDA. So the credited answer choice is A, bicuspid aortic valve. Now's the question that you probably anticipated first. What are you dealing with? Is this Turner syndrome, Vodder, Treacher Collins, Stickler, or Sodos? The correct answer is Turner syndrome.
Here are some features of Turner syndrome. I'll let you take a look at it for yourself. So uh, as most of you know, uh, this is caused by a complete or partial X chromosome monosomy. So in other words, they're uh, missing a chromosome. And what I want you to remember is that they have a risk of developing gonadoblastoma. What about the cardiac findings? So the most common congenital heart defect that these patients will have is bicuspid aortic valve, found in about 30%. But they can also have coarctations, valve aortic stenosis, uh, MVP, aortic root dilation or dissection. And this uh, illustration at the bottom shows the difference between a normal tricuspid aortic valve and a bicuspid, bicuspid aortic valve. So on to case number four. And one thing I want to mention is for all of these diseases that I'm showing pictures, you want to make sure that you're able to pick out the different diseases in different pigmented children. So if you are in a place where uh, you don't have a good mix, then make sure that you are looking at your Zetelli atlas or something like that, um, because uh, any, any pigmented skin is fair game. So this case number four is a three-year-old with seizures, hypopigmented macules, and developmental delay. Prenatal echo is on the left, and you can see pretty clearly to a tumor in the heart. And on the right, you can see this hypopigmented macule. So this is a resed up image of a tumor in the heart. Unfortunately, we have another third order question. What is the usual course of these cardiac masses? Your choices are, will they progress in size, regress in size, result in obstruction in cardiac output, or require surgical excision? So the answer is B. I'm not intuitive, but these particular masses tend to regress in size. Part of it is due to the fact that the heart is, big, is getting bigger, but the mass is uh, staying the same. But uh, another part of it is actually that the, the tumor itself is shrinking. So what is the most likely genetic diagnosis that we're dealing with? Is it Wardenberg, Treacher Collins, Sturge Weber, Smith? Lemley opitz or tuberous sclerosis? If you guess tuberous sclerosis, congratulations. Tuberous sclerosis is autosomal dominant, and most commonly there's a mutation in the TSC2 gene. Typical features of tuberous sclerosis include adenoma sebaceum. You can see that here. You can see these ash leaf spots, which are present in 90% of cases, common on the trunk and buttocks. So this is uh, most likely going to be shown to you if they really want you to have a fair chance of knowing what the genetic diagnosis is. So what else? They can have these shagreen patches, which is a type of collagenoma. And usually you see it over the lumbosacral region. They can also have these facial angiofibromas, which are these red-brown nodules that you can see over the nose and cheeks. And you can have forehead fibrous plaques, which are yellowish-brown or skin-colored. This is an example of periungual fibromas. And you can see some CNS abnormalities, which can include most commonly subependymal nodules, but you can also see cortical dysplasias, um, astrocytomas. Additionally, you can see seizures, autism, or ADHD in these patients. They can also have retinal hamartomas, and this is what a retinal hamartoma looks like. All right, who's ready for case five? We have an 18-year-old male with a pectus carinatum, flat feet, and a pneumothorax. There's a history of, sub, of lens subluxation, and there is a mid-systolic click followed by a 3 out of 6 apical systolic murmur. What is the most likely congenital heart defect? 
Could it be aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, pericarditis, or mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation? Did you guess choice E? If so, congratulations. So these patients can have pectus carinatum. They can have scoliosis. This is before and after, after they've had work done. They have reduced extension of the elbows. They have flat feet. And they can have ectopia lentis. So what is our mystery element? Is it Marfan syndrome, Treacher Collins, Sturge Weber, Smith Lemley Opitz, or neurofibromatosis? The correct answer is A, Marfan syndrome. Here's an image of a patient with Marfan syndrome. You can see the dilated aortic root. Another image, uh, you can see this dilated aortic root over here, and this is the normal aorta, so just a tremendously large aneurysm right over here. These patients can also have lumbosacral dural ectasia, which is a stretching of the dural sac. Again, make sure you know the, what the images look like for all the medical terms, because they can easily show you just an image, and you have, if you've only memorized the uh, term, then it, you'll have a lot more difficulty. Here's an example of the thumb sign and the wrist sign. I'm not going to go over all of the diagnostic criteria, but they're here for you to review. Some key points about Marfan syndrome, it's a fibrillin 1 abnormality, it's autosomal dominant. Typically we treat with beta blockers and or losartan. You want to survey them at least yearly with echocardiography and the decision for surgery is made when the aorta reaches 4.5 to 5 centimeters or if it's growing at a rate greater than 0.5 centimeters per year. This is an important point. What if uh, you have a patient who it appears that the patient has Marfan syndrome, but it's not an answer choice. So what if your quote unquote Marfan syndrome patient had these findings? Well, in this case, they don't have Marfan syndrome at all. They have Lois Dietz. So some common uh, features of Lois Dietz are hypertellerism, they have broad or bifid uvula, and a cleft palate. Just remember that picture of the bifid uvula and remember Lois Dietz. They can also have uh, arterial tortuosity with aneurysms, which can dissect uh, actually at smaller dimensions and earlier than those with Marfan syndrome. They may not even be tall. They, they could actually be short and they uh, don't necessarily have arachnodactyly. Their mutations are in the TGF beta receptor 1 or TGF beta receptor 2, and it's autosomal dominant. All right, let's continue this connective tissue disorder party. We should remember neonatal Marfan syndrome. It's more commonly called congenital contractural arachnodactyly, and it's the most severe and rapidly progressive form of Marfan syndrome. It can have, uh, well, typically it, it has uh, severe contractures. It can have dilation of the aorta, and it's a fibrillin 2 mutation. Case number six. We have a 16-year-old girl with skin hyperextensibility. You can see a picture of that. There's abnormal wound healing and joint hypermobility with frequent joint dislocations, and she has mitral valve prolapse. So what is your diagnosis? The correct answer is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And one type that I want you to know about is the type 4. It's the vascular type, and you can have aneurysms or dissection of medium to large muscular arteries that can occur anywhere throughout the body.
Type 1 is the classic form, and the genetic mutation is COL5A1 or COL5A2. The type 4 mutation is COL3A1. I don't think th it's super high yield to know these specific mutations, but you should know that it's autosomal dominant, and these uh, patients have to have periodic screening by some imaging modality like a CT or an MRI. On to case 7. So we have a 12-year-old girl with a history of syncope. The family history is significant for the father who drowned unexpectedly while swimming. However, he was uh, an elite swimmer. The paternal uncle has a history of syncope followed by seizures and the grandfather has a history of sudden death from unknown causes at an early age. Here's our EKG. And here's our answer choices. We have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, Brugada syndrome, Wolf-Parkinson-White, and Javel and Lang-Nielsen syndrome. And the correct answer is Javel and Lang-Nielsen syndrome, a form of long QT. So it's very important to know how to calculate the QTC. So you can see here that the QTC is the QT divided by the square root of the preceding R to R interval. In this case, it would be 0.66 divided by the square root of 0.84, and you get 0.72. Really, anything uh, greater than point, certainly anything greater than 0.5 is long QT, and then 0.4, uh, four around 0 0.44, 0 0.45, then you start getting into the borderline areas. For javelin nielsen syndrome, uh, you typically have a deaf child who experiences syncopal episodes during periods of stress, exercise, or fright. Uh, it's autosomal recessive uh, mutation in the KCNQ1 gene and they typically have profound bilateral sensory neural hearing loss and the long QT, which is usually greater than 500 milliseconds. And make sure you can contrast uh, Javel Wang Nielsen with Romano Ward. Romano Ward is autosomal dominant and it's not associated with deafness. So with long QT, you have a QT prolongation, T wave abnormalities, and torsades. The typical cardiac event uh, is commonly uh, from the preteen years through the 20s. And treatment for type 1 and type 2 is typically beta blockers. And uh, you, you, know, you can also consider ICDs uh, depending on the severity and your concern. And the prevalence is pretty common, 1 in 3,000. So here is a little chart uh, that describes the type of long QT, the gene responsible, the channel, the typical triggers, and your typical EKG findings. Okay, story time. So there was a situation where there was this guy who thought it was absolutely hysterical uh, to throw a book when his wife wasn't looking, and it would startle her. So she would pass out after she was startled, and he thought this was very funny. It was kind of like a party trick for him. And, uh, you know, everyone would laugh as, as his poor wife passes out. And, um, you know, despite uh, all of this, somehow uh, she was able to survive. So let's go over long QT type 7. It's known as anderson Taywell syndrome. And uh, this is significant, even though you won't see it uh, likely very often in practice, there are some uh, key findings that make it unique. So these patients have a triad of periodic paralysis, and I definitely want you to know that. Uh, ventricular arrhythmias, prolonged QT, and they have these specific dysmorphic abnormalities like low set ears, uh, hypertellurism, they have a small mandible, uh, clinodactyly, syndactyly, short stature, and scoliosis. And additionally, they have some learning difficulties.
So it presents in the first or second decade with uh, cardiac symptoms or weakness that can occur spontaneously following uh, prolonged rest or rest after exertion. It's autosomal dominant. Uh, case DN J2 mutation is the, is the mutation responsible. Uh, it's equally inherited, but it can also be uh, de equally de novo as well. And only about 60% of individuals have a detectable mutation. And that should, uh, you know, when you're thinking about ordering uh, genetic testing, you should always think about what you're going to do with the results. So how helpful for you is this test that is uh, going to only identify 60% of individuals? So let's turn to Timothy syndrome. So this is a uh, multi-systemic disorder where you have prolonged QT, which could lead to a heart block. Um, the most common congenital heart disease is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can have syndactyly, uh, global developmental delay, facial dysmorphisms, and uh, he can, they can be on the spectrum as well. These patients can have a low blood glucose. They are prone to infection and uh, usually around uh, the average of 2.5 years of age, they can die from ventricular arrhythmias. Type 1 is the most common, and it's caused by a mutation in the gene that encodes a calcium channel, CACNA1C. It's auto autosomal dominant, and it's usually de novo. Short QT uh, is a QTC less than 330 milliseconds, and these patients have syncope, AFib, or life-threatening arrhythmias. Another rare disorder that sometimes pops up on exams is Brugada syndrome. So for Brugada syndrome, the classic EKG findings are these ST segment uh, elevations typically in leads V1 through V3, and they are prone to sudden death from uh, vent ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, common in Southeast Asians, and the mutation is due to a loss of function in the SCN5A gene, and it is autosomal dominant. So here's an EKG of Brugada syndrome. You can see your classic findings in V1 and V2. And it looks kind of like a bundle branch block, uh, but you see it on the right uh, leads, but not in V5 and V6. OK, case number eight. So here we have an infant with a large tongue, flabby muscles, cardiomegaly, failure to thrive, and the following EKG. So here's our EKG. And what I want you to key in on here is the short PR interval and very high voltages. So these are like off the chart QRS voltages and a short PR interval. This is the, probably the, the easiest way to uh, pick up on this disease. Here's an echocardiogram, parasternal long axis view. The arrow is pointing to the ventricular septum, although the entire uh, left ventricle seems to be hypertrophied. So what's going on? We have Wolf Hirschhorn, Wardenberg, Pompey, Beckwith Wiedemann, or Cree Duchat. So did you guess Pompey's? If so, strong work. A couple of things about Pompey's. It's an autosomal recessive glycogen storage disorder, and there's a deficiency of the enzyme alpha glucosidase. So make sure you remember about that enzyme. Its infantile onset uh, will show hypotonia, cardiomegaly, hepatomegaly, failure to thrive, respiratory distress, and hearing loss. You may not see all of them, but these are all pretty common with Pompey's. You'll see the specific EKG findings that we described before, as well as the specific echocardiography findings and muscle biopsy findings as well. Uh, this is important because enzyme replacement therapy has really uh, tremendously improved the quality of life of these patients. So this is a helpful table uh, that details the disease, cardiovascular malformation of that disease, and the specific genetics.
I wanted to go over uh, Pompeii and Danand. Uh, one way to tell them apart is that Pompeii is typically presents in inf infancy and it's autosomal recessive. Danans uh, usually present the, at an older age, like a teenager or a young adult, and it's X-linked. And both of them can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, remember, Hunter's doesn't have the corneal clouding and it's X-linked. Carnitine deficiency is good to pick up because it's treatable if you give them carnitine. And another uh, mutation that you should know about is PRKAG2, and it's, in, it's associated with hypertrophic cardi cardiomyopathy and wolf parkinson white So let's turn to some neuromuscular disorders. We have Duchenne and Becker, and they have the classic uh, calf muscle hypertrophy. Uh, DMD usually presents in early childhood, whereas Becker is, uh, has a more of a later onset occurrence. First, you have the progressive muscle disease, and then later on, uh, respiratory issues and cardiac manifestations predominate. Dilated cardiomyopathy is another disorder to know about, and this is a uh, X-linked disorder. The serum CK concentration is going to be elevated, and muscle biopsy with dystrophin studies confirms the diagnosis. Treatment is supportive, and it's X-linked. Friedrich's ataxia was coined by Nicholas Friedrich, who was a German doctor who described the condition in the 1860s. I want you to remember that it's a slowly progressive ataxia, and the mean onset is between 10 and 15 years of age. They have dysarthria, muscle weakness, spasticity in the lower limbs, scoliosis. They have bladder dysfunction, absent lower limb reflexes, and a loss of position and vibration sense. So some very specific uh, testable points here. About two-thirds have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and there's a FXN gene mutation, which is actually an expanded GAA repeat. It's autosomal recessive, and the treatment is supportive. So if you're interested in going beyond the basics, here is a table of other neuromuscular diseases. So let's turn to some microdeletion syndromes, and these syndromes can't be picked up uh, purely by karyotype analysis. We need uh, to use probes like uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization for a fish. So case number nine, we have a patient with a prominent nose, cleft palate, hypernasal speech, a VSD. He has malrotation, frequent infections, hearing loss, and hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. So I'll give you a moment to ponder this diagnosis. So this is 22Q11 syndrome, also known as velocardiofacial, DeGeorge, or Sprinson. Heart defects are extremely common, most commonly being VSDs and right aortic arches. So it's a defect in the third and fourth branchial arches. You can have hypoparathyroidism, cellular immune deficiency secondary to the thymic hypoplasia. And don't forget to give these kids irradiated blood products. Common features are this prominent nose, uh, cleft palate, velopharyngeal insufficiency, and that's a failure of the velum or soft palate to close against the back of the pharyngeal wall during speech, and that's going to produce this uh, hypernasal speech that's difficult to understand. Case number 10. So our history is a one-year-old boy with a mild MR and a two-day history of URI symptoms. This is a picture of our child. The physical exam shows a 5 out of 6 systolic ejection murmur at the upper right sternal border. It radiates to the carotids. Blood pressure for this one-year-old is 107 over 60, and the calcium is 12 milligrams per deciliter. Here is this classic EKG. So what's the most likely cardiac diagnosis? Your choices are ASD, VSD, PDA, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, or innocent murmur. <laughs> 
and the correct answer is aortic stenosis. Here is an angiogram of this specific type of aortic stenosis. It's supravalvar. So remember that, supravalvar. Here are two pictures of a patient with this syndrome. So what is your diagnosis? Is it Williams, Kabuki, Allagile, Wolf-Hirschhorn, or Trisomy 21? The correct answer is Williams syndrome. So Williams syndrome is caused by a large uh, deletion on chromosome 7q11 and it, it includes the elastin gene. And you can see on the right some classic findings. Other findings, you can clearly see from the picture the stellate irises, uh, periorbital edema, the short nose with a bulbous nasal tip, the flat nasal bridge, uh, prominent full cheeks, uh, long filtrum wide mouth, these classic triangular facies, uh, the classic lips, and the mild micronathia. Typical cardiac manifestations are supravalvar aortic stenosis. That's the most common. Uh, you can also have supravalvar pulmonary stenosis, peripheral branch pulmonary artery stenosis, renal artery stenosis, and hypertension. So the vignette uh, pretty much writes itself. These patients have variable mental retardation. At first, they don't talk very much, and then they don't stop talking. They're super friendly. Um, they have this cocktail party persona and hyperacusis. Uh, unfortunately, there's more. They have ADHD and anxiety, or they can have ADHD and anxiety. And hypercalcemia is, is a good one to know as well. Uh, there's not too many syndromes that uh, result in hypercalcemia, but this is one of them. Other findings of Williams is uh, periorbital edema. They have these prominent lips that I want you to make sure you pick up on. Elastic gene variants can cause uh, an isolated autosomal dominant familial supravalvar aortic stenosis. So it may not actually uh, be Williams syndrome. Uh, and you can also see cutis laxus. Now we're going to turn to monogenic disorders. This is kind of a scary picture of the RAS MAP kinase pathway. We can see that defects in particular genes are going to cause particular syndromes. I don't think you need to memorize this slide at all. Case number 11. We have a six-year-old short boy in for a well-child checkup. He has a broad web neck, crypt orchidism, and the cardiac manifestation is a systolic click, an early systolic click at the upper sternal border. You can't quite tell if it's right or left, followed by a three out of six systolic ejection murmur at the left upper sternal border. Here's an example of the EKG. So what's the most likely cardiac defect? Your choices are aortic stenosis, VSD, ASD, pulmonary stenosis, or PDA. And the credited answer choice is pulmonary stenosis. Here we find some classic findings in this uh, syndrome. We see the classic web neck, wide space nipples, broad chest, scoliosis, uh, low posterior hairline. But there's more. So about 83% of them are going to be short. They're going to have hypertellurism. Um, we mentioned before this uh, low posterior hairline. The cardiac defects that I really want you to know are pulmonary valve stenosis. Um, but if you wanted to remember another one, remember hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the normal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will present, uh, you know, like an adolescent, a typical basketball player, you know, shoots a shot and then dies. So that's, you know, your classic uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy picture. But the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in these patients with this syndrome tend to occur much, much earlier.
So pulmonary valve stenosis and an early hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These patients, like I said before, have uh, scoliosis. They can have a pectus deformity, seizures. So what is this mystery diagnosis? Our choices are Leopard syndrome, Noonan, Klippel fail, Leshnyan, or Menkes. And the correct answer is choice B, Noonan syndrome. The mutation that you absolutely have to know that is associated with Noonan syndrome is PTPN11. Other mutations include RAF1, SOS1, and KRAS, but without a doubt, the most common is PTPN11. These patients have pulmonary stenosis, like we mentioned before. Uh, often the pulmonary valve itself is dysplastic. They can also have ASDs, VSDs, branch pulmonary stenosis, and we talked about that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The axis, the ventricular axis on the EKG is often uh, not normal, about 90% of the time, and it's autosomal dominant. We see the tall forehead, hypertellurism, down slanting palpebral fissures, and these posteriorly rotated ears. In the similar vein of uh, Noonan syndrome, we have multiple lentigineous syndrome. That's the proper term to call this. It used to be called leopard syndrome, but we're trying to move away from that. The findings are L for lentigines, E EKG abnormalities, O ocular hypertellurism, P pulmonic stenosis, A abnormality of the genitals, R retardation of growth, and D deafness. About 40% of them will have mild pulmonary stenosis with a dysplastic pulmonary valve, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, prolonged PR and QRS intervals, and abnormal P waves. And PTPN11, is a mutation that will cause multiple lentigenous syndrome as well as Noonan syndrome. Costello syndrome is a, another one of these uh, Noonan-like syndromes. They have coarse facial features. They have this curly, sparse, fine hair, which is a very helpful thing to know. They have uh, plantar creases, papillomata of the face, and perianal region. As expected, these patients have uh, cardiac defects, defects like uh, pulmonary stenosis, VSD, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, different dysrhythmias, and the HRAS mutation is seen in about 80 to 90 percent of these patients. So that's a good one to remember as well, as is the fact that it's autosomal dominant. The last uh, Noonan-like uh, syndrome that I'd want you to know is cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome. And these patients have a high forehead, macrocephaly, this bitemporal narrowing, so it looks like the forehead is kind of squeezed together. They have this sparse, curly, or woolly hair, and dystrophic nails. So the hair and the nails is very helpful to know, and it kind of gives you some clues with the name of the syndrome. They also have pulmonary stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and about 80% of the time they'll have the BRAF mutation. Case number 12, this is one of my favorites. We have a 10-year-old girl who is presenting for a well-child checkup. You astutely notice that the patient is missing thumbs on both hands. There is a widely fixed split S2, a two out of six systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border, and a one out of six short mid-diastolic murmur at the left lower sternal border. The family history is significant for multiple members of the family with heart murmurs, radial abnormalities, and cardiac conduction defects. And this is a EKG of the patient. So the EKG previously showed first degree heart block, but what is the most common cardiac defect? And our choices are ASD, VSD, PDA, tetralogy of Fallot, or dextrocardia with transposition and an interrupted aortic arch.
the correct answer is ASD, atrial septal defect. And what is the most likely genetic syndrome? Our choices are vactoral, holt orum, pulmonary treasure with multiple collaterals, uh, kabuki, or marfan. The correct answer is holt orum. Holt Orm syndrome is typified by upper limb defects, the narrow shoulders, the secundum ASDs, but they can also have VSDs as well, and they have uh, conduction defects and hypoplasia of the distal blood vessels. Holt Orm is typically autosomal dominant, and what you absolutely have to remember is TBX5 gene mutation is associated with it. So Holt Orum, TBX5, TBX5, Holt Orum. They have these preaxial rate array abnormalities of the upper limbs, and they can have uh, mild hypoplasia of the uh, upper arm bones, or they can have just a very severe focal milia type picture. One experience that I had that kind of ties together the Holt Orum story is a couple of years ago, I. Uh, I don't, I've never uh, seen an actual patient with Holt Orum, uh, and I was always, uh, but I was always on the lookout for that. And a patient comes in uh, with uh, an ASD, and that's pretty common for pediatric cardiology, so that didn't really excite me. So I'm kind of sitting back and talking to the uh, dad and the child, and uh, after a while, I take a look, and I notice that the dad is missing a thumb on his right hand. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. He's missing a thumb on his right hand. The child has an ASD. Wait a minute, this could be Holt Orum. So I was beyond excitement and I was trying to uh, ask more questions, but my brain was kind of going faster than my mouth. And finally, I just blurted out something like, uh, so you're missing a thumb. <laughs> and that probably wasn't the best thing to say. And he was like, you know, he showed it to me and he's like, this? I'm like, yeah. And he said, I got this in a lawnmower accident. So there went my possibility for Holt Orum. I'm not really sure about what the moral of the story is, but hopefully it'll help you remember Holt Orum. Now, I want you to compare and contrast Holt Orum with the next anomaly, which is radial aplasia thrombocytopenia. So I, uh, a number of years ago, it was called thrombocytopenia absent radius, but the more common terminology now is radial aplasia thrombocytopenia. These patients will have bilateral absent radiuses, but a presence of thumbs. So keep in mind, this one has a presence of thumbs. The uh, cardiac defects are manifest in about 22 to 33% of patients and common uh, cardiac malformations are tetralogy of flow and ASDs, and this is not associated with TBX5. Rubenstein Tabi is another interesting diagnosis. The classic findings of Rubenstein Tabi are these broad thumbs and toes. They have slanted palpebral fissures, they have uh, a hypoplastic maxilla. They also can have cardiac conduction defects, and the cardiac defects um, are most commonly VSDs, PDAs, and ASDs. Case 15. So we have a seven-year-old girl with a systolic murmur at the left and right axilla and back. There's hypercholesterolemia, butterfly vertebral arch defect, and mild MR, growth restriction, and a prominent chin. So this picture on the right is what uh, butterfly-like butterfly vertebral arch defects look like. So make sure that for any term, um, like a butterfly vertebral arch defect, you actually know what that looks like in case they gave you a picture. Because they don't necessarily have to give you the term, you are responsible for knowing uh, what the terms actually look like uh, in real life uh, on, on a person or in uh, imaging study. So I'll leave it to you to determine how butterfly-like these vertebral arches really look like.
This is a classic picture of a patient with this syndrome. There is a broad, prominent forehead, deep set, widely spaced eyes, this long nose and underdeveloped mandible. There is a posterior embryotoxin at the junction of the iris and cornea. A liver biopsy will demonstrate a paucity of intralobular bile ducts and cholestasis in the hepatocytes and the canaliculi. What syndrome are we dealing with? Is it Noonan's? Is it crude du chat? Is it Angelman? Allagile or Apert syndrome? The answer is Allagile syndrome. Most patients with Allagile syndrome are going to have neonatal jaundice. Uh, cholestasis develops in patients, though, up to about three years of age. The genetic association that you absolutely have to know is JAG1. It's autosomal dominant, and 88% of patients will have this JAG1 mutation. Most commonly, the congenital heart disease is going to be pulmonary stenosis, but you can also have tetralogy of flow and transposition. Our next uh, syndrome is Ellis Van Crevald. It's also known as chondroectodermal dysplasia. Uh, you can see issues with the bones, teeth, and nails. They have short distal extremities, polydactyly, and nail hypoplasia. Uh, if you remember, uh, Ellis Van Crevald is also known as chondroectodermal dysplasia. It can help you remember the actual findings. 60% of them are going to have a cardiac defect. Most commonly, it's ASD or single atrium. Sing anytime you see a patient with a single atrium, essentially, uh, you have to have Ellis Van Crevald high up on your differential. Another disorder that makes its way onto exams are the primary ciliary dyskinesias, the most common being Car Cartagener syndrome. Patients with Cartagener syndrome are susceptible to uh, recurrent infections, like respiratory infections, and they have situs inversus totalis, so the um, organs as like uh, liver, uh, things like that, are uh, inverted as well as the heart, and it's autosomal recessive. Case number 16 is a classic case. We have a patient who is six years old, and this boy has a healed scar on the back and axilla, uh, denoted by the arrows. He has a cleft palate and a prominent nose. There's low serum calcium and elevated serum phosphorus. The child is frequently ill, and when he turns around to look at you, you see this. So what is your diagnosis? So those are colobomas, and this patient has CHARGE syndrome. So CHARGE syndrome is the constellation of coloboma, heart disease, atresia coenae, retarded growth and development, uh, genital abnormalities, ear abnormalities, the most common heart defects are ASDs and VSDs, and the gene mutation is CHD7. In the same vein, we have vectoral association, and with that is uh, vertebral anomalies, anal atresia, cardiac defects, TE fistula, renal disease, and limb defects. The genetics for vectoral are not well understood. There's some teratogens that I want you to know about. Uh, the three listed on this slide are fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal valproate syndrome, and retinoic acid. Fetal alcohol syndrome, they, patients typically have small palpebral fissures. Uh, for fetal valproate syndrome, it's associated with uh, meningomyelocele, and you can see that uh, illustration to the right. And retinoic acid is a really good one to know. That one uh, is a combination of microodia, so that's small ears, and conotruncal abnormalities. Now we're going to turn to some dyslipoproteinemias. Familial hyperlipidemia is very important to know about. 
these patients are characterized by mutations in LDL receptor or ApoB100. Uh, it can be heterozygous or homozygous. Heterozygotes have a cholesterol of about 300 and LDLs of around 240. Homozygotes, though, they are much more severely affected. They have cholesterols at least 600. I've seen up to 1,200 and LDLs greater than 400. Treatment includes statin therapy, plasmapheresis uh, for homozygotes, among others. Familial combined hyperlipidemias are associated with uh, abnormal LDL and triglycerides greater than the 90th percentile. It's linked to uh, early coronary artery disease. It's autosomal dominant, and we don't know exactly uh, all of the genes involved, and it likely has uh, multiple gene involvement. Here's a great Scrabble word for you, hypo-alpha-lipoproteinemia. So patients have a normal LDL and triglycerides, and the HDL is less than the 10th percentile. They uh, can have coronary artery diseases, uh, strokes. Uh, it seems to be autosomal dominant, and the gene mutation is in ABCA1 or ApoA1. Now we're going to turn to some mitochondrial disorders. There are three that I'd like to point out, Melas, kern serre and Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy. So Melas is uh, mitochondrial myopathy. You have an encephalomyopathy, lactis, lactic acidosis, stroke-like symptoms, and cardiomyopathy. kern serre is a chronic progressive ophthalmoplegia, and which is really just an eye muscle paralysis. They have uh, AV blocks and different cardiac conduction defects. And uh, Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy is associated with Wolf Parkinson White. So anytime you see an associated with Wolf Parkinson White, that's uh, a very easy question to ask. The final syndrome involving the heart uh, that I'd like to talk about is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. You see multiple AVMs, there's epistaxis, uh, these visceral AVMs, and cutaneous or mucosal tel telangiectasias. They can have a high output cardiac failure from these liver AVMs. The, uh, the d uh, disease is autosomal dominant and treatment is supportive. And the mutations involved uh, are TGF-beta, uh, the BMP signaling cascade, those types of things. Finally, we will talk about genetic screening. In general, the population risk for congenital heart disease is about 1%. For families who uh, have one affected child, the recurrent risk is about 2 to 5%. And for parents of two affected children, the recurrence risk is 10 to 15%. The gender of the parent involved also matters. If the mom is affected, there's a 2.5 to 18% uh, recurrence risk versus if the father is affected, it drops to 1 to 5%. And uh, lastly, I want you to keep in mind that autosomal dominant diseases can have a reduced penetrance, so it doesn't always have to follow the perfect uh, genetic diagram tree. Well, I hope this lecture was informative, and I hope it serves you well on your board exams. If there's anything I can do to help you uh, in any way, uh, just reach out to me and let me know. Best of luck on your exams.